So, to our keynote speaker at our event today, as a Lincolnshire boy, uh, born in the south of the county, Jonathan Fall visited Lincoln Cathedral and was captivated by the tale of the naughty Lincoln imp, we've seen an image of that already, uh, being cast in stone by the inhabitants of the Angel Choir. As I mentioned earlier, the last time I think uh, Jonathan was here in the city was to film the BBC TV series Climbing Great Buildings. Today, Jonathan will talk about how buildings and places that we see in the county every day can become inspirational when we think about their special qualities. Ladies and gentlemen, please you to welcome Jonathan Foyle. Thanks so much, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in anticipation, because I'm going to give you a bit of tough love sometimes, but love is what it is. Um, but what you don't want is to be told what I think you want to hear. Um, the benefit, as I see it, of being born in the county and being raised in Lincolnshire and then spending half of my life away with it, is that when I experience it now, I know what the experience was, and I can see how things have changed. But I've also been around a bit and seen how other places have benefited from having their stories told. I'm a historian, as I see it, um, but a historian who believes in the service of history. You often hear a justification of history that it teaches us about ourselves and where we've come from. And for the curious, that's fine. But for the people who want to inform the next generation and where we're going to, history, I do think, holds lessons. It never repeats itself exactly, but if you can harness what it means and turn it into something tangible, then I think history has found its best use. So this is going to be exploring what history can tell us about Lincolnshire and what its uses are. First question, what are we like? What are we like? Can we turn these lights down? Is that possible? Just this one row? Please. Just the, the image will be a bit sharper. What are we like? Rhetorical question, obviously. We could be here for hours figuring that one. We are like monkeys. Admittedly, a bit more like Arthur Askey than the, than the monkey in question. But we are obviously hominids. And, but what makes us separate to other animals? There are several things which um, divide us rather than make us similar. We organize our environments. And what I mean by that is, of course, we don't just build houses, architecture. We construct through morality a code of conduct for our environment through law. Um, we make things. We've got thumbs. They're useful. We make stuff. And we tell stories. Those are the three things. You can look at a variety of psychologists um, and anthropologists that give us separation from animals. These are the three essential simple things. And to me, telling stories is the most profound of them all because through those things, we create cultural identity. Now, animals don't do that, do they? You don't find a museum of dolphin art, um, uh, intelligent as they are. Bees create their own environments, at least with honeycomb, with incredible skill. They certainly know how to strike 60 degrees. But um, that's all they can do. We create cultural identity. Now look at something as genteel as this. I want to make you think about how stories can take the familiar and show you things in a different way. Um, porcelain, late 19th century. Um, coal port, it's quite pretty, but too fancy for me. Porcelain, where does that word come from? What does it make you think of first? Porcelain, tell me. What... Need hands. What does porcelain make you think of? Thank you very much. From China. Some associative words. Porcelain. Dull. Dull. Thank you. Another one. Chintz. Chintz. Chintz and dull. They go hand in hand. Yep. Fragile. Fragile. Thank you. Any more? Fancy. Fancy. Maybe genteel. That kind of thing. Okay. So we know what porcelain means in our mind. We have this image built of porcelain. Where does porcelain come from? Porce. Porce. Where have you heard porce? P-O-R-C. French. P-O-R-C, pork. The word porcelain comes from the cowrie shell on the left because it bears a resemblance to that material. Translucent, hard, smooth, an elegant type of china. The word comes from French porcelain. We know it from the 15th century. Porcellana in Italian from the 13th century. The Italians got it from the ancient Romans who used it as a pejorative for the female genitalia. The middle image shows you why. The business end of a cowrie shell has some resemblance. In countries around the world today, 
cowrie shells are used as fertility symbols. So African dolls, for example, in the um, Sumatra, they're used as birthing uh, charms, if you will. So all of a sudden, this refinement, this gentility, the chintziness has turned into really quite a gutsy and earthy thing about reproduction and um, Roman vulgarities. So the same, the, the commonplace can tell us about things in a polycultural way. I don't mean multicultural, where we have lots of silos of different ways of thinking. I'm thinking about the joined up human experience. What's this? See, I want interactivity, but without the iPads. Um, transported to a surreal landscape, a young girl kills the first woman she meets, teams up with three complete strangers to kill again. What is it, ladies and gents? Story of, yep, you're right, the man at the back, it's the Wizard of Oz. And we watch it and enjoy it in Christmas, this story of a young girl going on a killing spree, much as we do if we think about it, with a slice of Dundee cake and a cup of tea with a nice murder on a Sunday evening. We're curious creatures, aren't we? And so we have to think about the way we tell stories, because the spin we put on it can make it almost polarised sometimes. London 2012, we've all seen it. What a familiar story that was. What sport's this? Wrestling, anyone else? Maybe a martial art? What do you think? Rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> Could be, couldn't it? Um, not entirely clear to everyone uh, what that is. So visually, we've got to get the story right. In the detail, it's equally as important, if not more so. The next slide shows you my local cafe in London, and it shows you how the details can truly transform what you're being told. The mixed seafood is rarely ordered. I'll leave it at that. So telling a story has to be done with the utmost care. How do I tell stories? Well, television, sometimes, this is part of climbing great buildings dangling in St. Paul's. The, the way that stories are told with television is the two J's very often with factual television. Gone are the days when you stand up and deliver an illustrated lecture. It's got to involve the J's of the journey. You have to be on a journey and take people with you. And that journey's got to have, do you know the other J? It's jeopardy. It's a journey with jeopardy, a bit like The Wizard of Oz, really. That's why it's so popular. It's classic. It's age old. You have to be out of your comfort zone going from A to B for the audience to follow you because what they don't like is being talked at. So this, <laughs> for a specialist in architecture, is television's way to say, all right, you do it, we'll watch. Um, and maybe you'll be able to see things in an unfamiliar way. Um, that seemed to work. I also write for newspapers for the Financial Times at the weekend on architecture. That's a totally different discipline. Um, I'll explain the structure of storytelling in a second, but a completely different way of thinking about the resonance of words, the multi-layered meanings that words have, and the pictures you try and assemble in a reader's mind. It's not a visual thing, it's, um, it's a thing about words. And that translates into books. Now, the difference between an article and a book, you have to sustain the interest throughout a book if you can, and that's why I use drawings, because a picture does paint a thousand words, and it lets people go on their own journey when they walk through that cutaway of Canterbury Cathedral and the East End. Uh, again, an unfamiliar view. It's a bit like climbing at, at, at 800 feet after the cathedral's collapsed, I suppose, in a literal way. And then talks, which is another discipline, again. The shape of stories, to me, this is how I've distilled them. Um, the start of any story has got to grab you. You've got to do something which gets your attention. You've got to intrigue you. You've got to want to know more, but then orientate you as well. So your expectations have to be set. Three is a magic number, like a building with a roof, walls, and, and foundations. A story has got to have a start, a middle, and an end. And the middle has to increase the complexity. I'm about to do that. Um, it's got to entertain you. I'm not so sure about that. It's got to inform you, and that's the hopeful end result, that you come away with something, you have takeaway. And so the end has to resolve all of those strands of complexity that you've set out. Um, you've got to conclude the thing properly rather than just uh, ending in the middle of a sentence, but you've got to satisfy. Whatever story you tell, and this is for tourism as much as anything else, the message you put out, I think, has to have these three main elements. So how do stories work, ladies and gents? Well, here is a case study. Who goes to Coventry for a romantic weekend? Anyone? <laughs> Had a friend at college, a Lincoln actually, his name was Warwick Butterfield. A lovely name, isn't it? I said, how'd you get the name Warwick? He said, well, my parents went for a weekend in Warwick and I was conceived. 
Lovely, warm and toasty all round. Coventry, I've never met anyone called Coventry. <laughs> Kirsty Coventry the swimmer, doesn't count. Coventry, what an impression that is. Any adjectives for me? Dull, thank you. There's a, there's a stereo dull there going, and that's good. Anyone else? Grey. Grey, dull, grey. Bleak. bleak, thank you. Dull, grey and bleak, that's nice. Beginning, middle and end of Coventry. Um, cat bin lady, she comes from Coventry. <laughs> Piece of ephemeral news for you. Um, the longest standing news in Coventry is that it was today, 14th of November, 1940, 72 years ago, the victim of the first major raid on Britain uh, by the Luftwaffe. It became a, a place where 600 lives were lost, um, two-thirds of the historic city was lost, and the only cathedral to be destroyed by British bombs was destroyed on that night. What a public perception to leave us. And then in the 60s, they built that ring road. What hope does Coventry have of telling its story effectively? Especially when, even before the Luftwaffe came, in 1936, they began a program of street improvements for the motor cars that were being produced in Coventry. And so they pulled down the medieval streets because they were too narrow and replaced them with broader avenues. And these streets all went in 1936. They would have been, in fact, better than York as an experience. New York's got the shambles. Coventry would have had a network of similar streets. And so today, the impression in Coventry is one where historians, noble as is the pursuit of recording, have a title for the Coventry We Have Lost series. Where's the redemption? It's gone, isn't it? It's gone. Where's the hope? Um, there is nonsense Coventry, which is Lady Godiva. Um, we hear about this naked equestrianism episode a century after it's supposed to have happened by a scurrilous monk of St. Albans, actually. Um, it's almost certainly not true. Um, and then there's pretend Coventry, the schemes for the redesign of this hopeless city into something which is, looks like a 24-hour nightclub, airbrushed other social issues. But in the middle of Coventry, if you were to go there for uh, a romantic weekend, what you would find is the only city with three cathedrals. On the far side, just um, there, are the ruins of St. Mary's Priory, actually founded by Lady Godiva. The real historical figure gave her wealth, gave her jewels and gems to this priory in 1043 with her husband, Earl Leofric. Stowe Minster in Lincolnshire was also um, supported by her. The second cathedral is this, St. Michael's, which is the tallest parish spire in Lincoln, sorry, Louth, uh, in, in, in Britain. So Louth claims to be at 295, this is 303, but it's forgotten that this is a parish church. I'm sorry to bring you that news, I told you about the tough love. And it's the largest parish church um, by area. It became a cathedral only in 1918, so it's a cathedral by default. This is cathedral number three. So within this tight area, there are three cathedrals plus something that looks like a mini Salisbury Cathedral, Holy Trinity Church, and then the best surviving guild hall in medieval England. Let's explore that. Here is a symbol for a new way of looking at Coventry. It's a shattered piece of stained glass on which a Georgian glazier has scrawled the words Coventry. It's historically authentic, but it hopefully captures your attention. Coventry is important because it was, for a brief time, the capital of England. In 1421, young Henry VI was born there. He's shown in this picture on the left. He's born, sorry, born in Windsor. He um, wasn't born there. Um, and he was, he had two coronations. One was in um, Notre Dame in Paris. Um, and the reason for that is that his father was the victor of Agincourt, Henry V, the warrior who beat the French, increased the French territories, and married a French queen. Catherine of France came back with a dowry of something like 600,000 francs. He wanted 750, they said five, they settled on six, that'll do. Uh, with that money, he picked up, head did Henry V, um, the problems of his father, Henry Bolingbroke, the rebel king from Lincolnshire, who called for the death of Archbishop Scrope of York. And the Pope said, right, you monarchs of England, you need to build three monasteries to make up for an archbishop's death. What do you think you're doing? It's like Thomas Beckett all over again. So in the area around Kew Gardens and off the Royal Thames, Henry V founds three monasteries. This is one we found 
um, were digging with Time Team in 2003, and this is my reconstruction of it. It's Cyan Abbey. It's more or less the size of Westminster Abbey by area. Totally forgotten about until we dug it up. Three monasteries with that money. And here is the seal of that Bridgetine uh, Priory. Here is Henry VI then, the son who actually had the job. Even at six years old, the foundation for that monastery went down with his father's money. And um, he became a pious king. He didn't just build out of obligation. Here he is at the Shrine of St. Edmund in Suffolk, Bury St. Edmunds, um, in, in 1438. Um, so he's aged just 17 to 18 there. He is a saintly king. People criticized him. They said he is not a warrior like his father. But his uncles certainly held up the efforts in France. He married um, a French bride, um, and he didn't like to tell anybody that he'd given away or ceded some of the lands in France as part of the marriage deal. Um, when he did so, civil war of the Wars of the Roses beckoned when people found out. His wife, um, Margaret of Anjou, um, created this, Queen's College um, um, Queen's College. In, in Cambridge, quite a plain building as it goes, but it shows her dedication to creating colleges. This is Henry VI's own efforts at Eton. Only the chancel of Eton College Chapel was built. If the nave had been built, it would have been about the length of Salisbury Cathedral. An exceptional thing. This is where the money was going in the 15th century. And then in 1446, he began King's College Chapel, Cambridge, um, as part of King's College, where the scholars of Eton, 70 of them, would matriculate and go to Cambridge. And the amount he built is demonstrated by that wedge there. Why am I showing you Cambridge and not Lincolnshire? Well, because it comes back to Coventry. When those grand royal buildings were being constructed and the trouble was brewing, which led to the um, Lancastrian and Yorkist houses fighting for um, 30 years or so, what did Henry VI do? Well, in the 1450s, he went to Coventry because this was the heartland of the Lancastrian dynasty. And they stayed in Kenilworth and they walked through this road, which was Bailey Lane, between St. Michael's with its superlative spire and St. Mary's Guildhall, which had been built and finished by 1400 as a place for the merchants of Coventry to make their money from blue cloth and invest that cash into the building of the church next door. Now, they created works of sculpture, like this fine angel. There are about 40 of these left in St. Mary's Hall. And the money then went into St. Michael's, including the stained glass that's streaming through the windows in the clear story. Make a note of that, please, because today that clear story level is gone, and all you see is the shattered shell of the church that they built. They made progressions through Coventry and down Bailey Lane and into this seat of power at St. Mary's Hall right next to the church and they would also have seen work like this um, at Holy Trinity just above the chancel arch there is one of the best surviving doom paintings showing Christ in judgment where people rise from their graves and through his blessing um, they then proceed to heaven or otherwise they're cast down into the gaping jaws of hell the um, the one to match it really is St. Thomas's uh, in Salisbury, but an incredible tableau of life and thought and belief in the 15th century. Henry then was not a warrior king. Here you can see him um, seeding arms. Um, he looks rather meek. Um, he was criticized for not being magnificent enough. And it was in 1455 when the Battle of St. Albans broke out, the most exciting thing to have happened in that town, I think. Um, it lasted for half an hour. The the medieval artists were more interested in the topiary, really. It was enough to upset the king, and he left his threatened capital, London, to come to Coventry and Kenilworth. And so they processed through the town, went down Bailey Lane, and already by 1451, the king had left, we know, a robe of tissue furred with Martin sable, a furred royal robe, to the church of St. Michael. And um, here is stained glass showing a typical um, edging of such a robe. So he held court in here, in St. Mary's Guildhall, giving a lesson, a lecture, on good governance from the voice of a king. And when he became mentally unwell, the queen did that in his stead. Remarkably, this window above the tapestry still has a figure of Henry VI from 1456 in the middle of the great conquering kings of England, showing how he was supposed to um, 
want to be seen in, the, in a bloodline of the great conquering kings of the past, King Arthur, Constantine, Richard the Lionheart, and his namesakes of the Henrys. So that is the Piccadilly Circus of the royal monarchy in an age when it's threatened, and it's in Coventry. When the Wars of the Roses were concluded, Henry VII came to Coventry to cement his power over the city, and he commissioned a tapestry which still hangs in the wall for which it was intended. And it shows Henry VII, Elizabeth of York, um, worshipping. And there's the, the Virgin there. This is St. Mary's Guildhall. And there was once God above it, and the Trinity probably replaced by a 17th century justice. This is the oldest tapestry hanging for where it was intended in Britain. And at that time... Henry VII approached the papacy in Rome to have Henry VI, his uncle, made a saint. Therefore, modern England, the Tudor realm, was appealing um, to have this saintly bloodline may, um, as an argument for Henry VII's right of rule. That's the reason why Henry VII's chapel was constructed in Westminster Abbey, was to house the saintly shrine of Henry VI, but papal permission never came. So much of Coventry's conclusion of Coventry's story is a what might have been. However, when I did climbing great buildings, the cathedral said to me, have you heard about, our, do you know about our medieval stained glass? And I said, well, I've seen a few shattered pieces in St. Michael's. They said, no, we've got, it was all taken out before World War II and before the Blitz. Uh, it was brought down from the clear story, all the glass that survived, and was put in store. We don't know what to do for it, with it. We haven't shown it for 70 years. And there it is. Um, it happens to be the nation's largest collection of loose medieval glass. What do you do with it? It's a liability more than an asset, except if you tell a story about it. And if you can unpackage that glass and tell the story of how that blue cloth that generated that extraordinary wealth and made a capital um, can be once again seen, if you clean up the glass and shine a light through it, you can see a blue hat made of Coventry cloth. All of a sudden, the problem becomes an asset and a resource. The stained glass can be made up into panels, things of beauty that can be put on display and actually start to make Coventry a cultural capital, somewhere you'd want to travel to uh, and where you want to see. If we told you that the stained glass was made by John Thornton, the man who did the York Minster East Window, which has had more than 10 million pounds of lottery funds. He came from Coventry because the bishops um, took him up to the city from 1405 to 8 to complete it. Then we have the largest collection of medieval glass associated with the largest surviving stained glass window and links between cities. That's the quality of, of, of his work. And you can see a direct comparison with a Coventry window there and a York window just there. The Climbing Great Buildings then saw the cathedral from a different angle. We got lots of good responses from Twitter, people who said, I graduated from this town and I never realized the cathedral was there. What an interesting place when you look at it close up. But its ruins started failing, and so it was added to the World Monuments Watch List of endangered sites. This brought international um, awareness to it, and so we thought, why not see if we can rebrand Coventry by taking the stained glass revealing the faces of that 600-year-old city, which enable us to tell the historical importance of the place, show what's left to many people's surprise, and make it a place worth visiting. And so we brought University of Lincoln, um, Cricksmith Conservation at the University, with the staff and students into Coventry to show the process of cleaning the glass, revealing it. It went onto BBC websites, and we had open sessions where Anyone could come and watch it being done, but there were also Thursday visits and talks. And now the best of that glass we've put on display in Sir John Soane's museum, taken it to London, and therefore got the attention of the capital on this extraordinary story. So there's an introductory case there, and in the middle of the first room in the Soane Museum, you can go and see it now, are some of the finest pieces of Coventry's glass, each one of which gives you a window into this, into this city. The next stage with the attention galvanized, is to try and turn the ruins, again, not into a mouldering problem, but into something which is useful and uh, of benefit to the city. So it becomes called Changing the Face of Coventry, and I hope, I hope that story takes you a long way from that impression. The reason for going into depth away from Lincolnshire is to say that a city with a lousy impression 
by taking its assets and telling a story and making something that involves people can transform the way you perceive it. What are Lincolnshire's issues then? Um, I've talked to people in the last couple of months. Uh, hard to reach is one impression. Fair enough or not? Um, they reckon it's mostly avoided by the main routes. Yeah, you, you do get dropped off in Peterborough for the south, I guess, Grantham, but then it's a big county, isn't it? Um, isn't it flat? Isn't it? Is it flat? Not really. It depends where you go, doesn't it? Um, so there's little public idea of what Lincolnshire's essential character is. It's not a one-hit wonder of a, of a county, though, is it? It's, it's not like Cornwall, maybe, where you could say, you know, they're uplands surrounded by coast. You know, it's fish and moors, essentially. You can't be that um, clear with Lincoln. Skegness is so bracing. There's a bit of branding that may not help you. The North Sea, the wind whistles in, doesn't it? If you want to go for a winter stride down the beach, put a scarf on and, then, and, and go for a sprint down Skegness um, Beach. Um, the benefit, of course, we all know that genetically uh, we have, we're disposed to have lower fuel bills in many other parts of the country uh, from that, being exposed to the cold. Um, what do Lincolnshire people do or make? What's it famous for? What's Lincolnshire famous for? Sausages. Sausages, thank you. Uh, Fa farming, farming, sausages, thank you. Anyone else? We're going to revisit this, but let's have some ideas now. What's it famous for? Daffodils, Daffodils thank you. What are the things that you can, you can bring out and make exciting to people? Boston, Boston Stump. Aviation Heritage. Aviation Heritage, thank you. It's a, it's a broad, it's a diverse mix there, isn't it? This is, this is the thing with working with a county rather than a city, I guess. Uh, you almost got too much. So, what are we like in Lincolnshire? Well, let's think about what's world class first. Um, there are three obvious things to me. Lincoln Cathedral, it is the finest cultural product of mankind in the county, no question. It's my favorite building in the world, I have to say, and I, that's on record. The Humber Bridge is an astonishing thing. Uh, who cares about modern Humberside and so on? It's Lincolnshire that it spans. Um, the jet engine as well, which kicks into aviation history. Uh, Link, let's let's meet, talk about the cathedral first. Look at that. What a situation for a cathedral. It is dominated, isn't it, this scarp, by this amazing work of mankind. This is why it's one of the buildings I, I chose to climb in that BBC Two series. Incredibly windy day. Skeg Skegness is bracing. So was Lincoln on this day. Um, and the bell rang when I got to that particular height. It was a scary climb, 280 feet to the top, but a masterpiece I'd only ever looked up at. And to look over your shoulder and see this city in 2,000 years of history, from the Roman road in to what we know to be the Saxon settlement, and then from the greatest medieval building, um, was an absolute thrill. The bishop's palace was at our feet. All this is hidden away. But when you're at the top and you're standing on that truncated pyramid and you imagine that what you've climbed is only half the height of what for the Guinness Book of Records was the tallest building in the world for half a millennium. It collapsed in a gale in 1546, it must be said, but nothing beat it till the 19th century. It could be seen for 40 miles away. Lincoln Cathedral was the visual linchpin of the entire county. You could see it from Boston. So it was always the spike in the center point of the county, and thus it still is. With the castle now, I think there's every reason for regarding it as a hub um, uh, for the county. Um, uh, those are my rubbish graphics, by the way. I'm quite a Luddite. I normally do things in watercolor. Um, but why not put lasers on the top of the tower and show the spire with eight lasers all converging on a point? Why not do that? Um, It'd be great, wonderful to see, I think. And it would be visible. If it's visible from 40 miles, why not do that? Why not make it something utterly spectacular? I remember driving toward Las Vegas once, and you could see the laser coming out the top of that um, pyramid, you know? You can see it from about 80 miles away. And um, it's cheap, and it's kitsch in that context. But you remember the ground zero lasers? They did something which is much more meaningful. Now, why not reinstate the height of what was the world's tallest building with eight lasers? Oh, they'd love it. Just fly around it. <laughs> Humber Bridge, the world's longest um, bridge when it was opened in 1981. Never mind Charlie and Di's wedding. This is where it was at for many. Um, it's now the world's sixth longest bridge, um, but it is still an engineering marvel. And it is still the longest bridge, ladies and gentlemen, you can cross on a bicycle. <laughs> Make the most of that. 
The jet engine. Um, others know better than I the story of Frank Whittle, <laughs> actually from Coventry, the, was the irony. But he, he comes to Cranwell just as the old college is being built, and he finds himself flying planes like the one bottom left, and he leaves a legacy of the Gloucester with the jet engine bottom right. He develops this in tandem with German developments, it must be said, and if the ministry were behind him, it would have been developed first, but hey-ho, it's a bit of a compromise, but still 42nd, I think, in the league table of um, uh, greatest Britons ever. Um, but you could say that the developments at Cranwell by this extraordinary man and where his remains have come to rest is something that utterly transformed the modern world and our perception of it, the commercial use of the jet engine. And that's something that I'm sure Lincoln, Lincolnshire already um, trades on. The problem, though, with world's greatest is keeping it up, isn't it? I mean, what a, what a, what a hard thing to maintain. And look how Texas does it. Billy Bob's Texas is the world's largest honky-tonk. Forget any other honky-tonk. That's the honky-tonk that matters. Um, historical, the world's smallest Catholic church. You don't get it to see the church. You see the sign, don't you? You don't, of course, no. But, but um, if you were to visit, you go to take a picture of the sign. Seguin, Texas, home of the world's largest pecan. That's not a pecan, that's a model of a pecan. What are you talking about? It's a, it becomes, quickly becomes ridiculous, the competition of world's largest, world's smallest, world's most, um, insert, adjective. And um, so Texas State Fair in the 50s um, created the world's largest animatronic talking cowboy, which uh, last month became the world's largest animatronic talking cowboy to burn down. <laughs> they may well rebuild it, but the absurdity of maintaining world-beating status is quickly exhausting. So could Lincolnshire be overstretching? Well, it has done it once in a while. This is the monorail from 1959 to 62 at uh, Disneyland. And yeah, if you've got a mountain it emerges from, having picked up from hotels and, uh, and it's a great pool that now has uh, Finding Nemo um, submarines and you've got President Nixon in the front, you know, it's, it's a marketing success. And, by the way, palm trees and endless sunshine, that's great. Here's Skegness in 1962, hot on the trail, next to the camp train. Um, it's okay, isn't it? It's a bit of fun. But trying to keep up with Disneyland is an enormous um, arena to put yourself in. And that's where Skegness' uh, monorail is now. It's in a field. Um, rather a sad, pathetic end, really. Um, so, best concentrate on being proud of the things that are historically world-beating, but doing something else today. We have far fewer means. The dynamic of the Western world to the Eastern world is shifting, as we all know. And I think we should celebrate the genius Linkai. What is it that makes Lincolnshire what it is? Where does this come from? I was looking for yellow belly, you know? The whole yellow belly thing. Where does that come from? That's the best picture I could find. It's not from eating endless Haribo yellow bellies. I'm delighted to see them in a shop. Of course, it's the name of a snake as a yellow belly. Where does yellow belly come from? Malaria. malaria. That's a theory of malaria in the swamps. Um, military uniforms. Any more? A frog. Nice. They're all live theories. The military uniforms go from the 10th Regiment of Foot, which became the North Lincolnshire Regiment after 1782. Um, they've got yellow trim. I don't see a yellow waistcoat there. I, I, I could be missing something. The Cambridgeshire, 30th Regiment of Foot, in an 18th century drawing, do have yellow waistcoats. Um, there's Captain Yellowbelly, by the way, a book which talks about a captain as a coward. Unfortunate undertone for militaries. Why did they call themselves yellow bellies? Um, here is... Gross's Dictionary of 1787, when the regiment had just been formed. Yellow bellies is an appellation given to persons born in the fens, which is jocularly said have yellow bellies like their eels. So we have at least an 18th century association with the colour of eels of fenland dwellers. Where are the majority of the fens? Cambridgeshire. So there is, rather than the North Lincoln Regiment, the 18th century idea is it's South Lincolnshire into Cambridgeshire is yellow belly country. So um, this fundamentally shifts what we think yellow belly means. It belongs to a certain type of geology and landscape. Um, again, 1840, the same thing is claimed. 
1847, yellow belly, a person born in the fens of Lincolnshire. The malaria thing might be um, relatable there as well. We know it happened in the Middle Ages. So there's things we don't know about ourselves. Fundamentally, where our nickname comes from, it's one of the things that, to me, Lincolnshire has several, several strands. There's much to be explored, even throughout the familiar. Um, and when we look at the rock that under, underscores the county, this band of yellow that goes from Somerset and Dorset through the Cotswolds, up through Northamptonshire and Lincolnshire, where it narrows and creates the scarp that the cathedral sits on, that fine band of limestone gives us the forgotten end of the Cotswolds, doesn't it? We know it's there. We know places like Great Ponton have um, beautiful churches, fine manor houses, Woolsthorpe Manor, and so on. And it goes up toward Wintringham on the Humber. There's this amazing uh, correlation between fine architecture, Grantham Spire, for example, Burley House, and this extraordinary geology. The clay is what defines the fens. The chalk is what defines the walls and, and, and louth. And when you look around the county, that architecture is stunning. It holds its own to anywhere else in Britain and is often record-breaking um, oh, and incredibly fine craftsmanship. And we have immense resources of fine historic buildings in Lincolnshire. I can remember living near Stamford and going to college there. The first time people turned up in number was when Middlemarch came out and it was used as a film set. And fudge, Middlemarch, fudge and tea towels came out, you know, not knocking local enterprise, but it's only 80 miles north of London on the straight main road north. Why don't people, more people know about it? Maybe it'd be spoiled if they did. Gainsborough is the finest surviving medieval great hall in Britain. A, a, a fabulous ensemble, a, a view into the 15th century that is the domestic equivalent of anything at Coventry. Why don't we make the most of it? Um, having done the app for, for Gainsborough, um, I'm, I'm thoroughly behind that. Where there's been innovative thinking about Lincolnshire's quirkiness and overlookedness um, is in the big sky country territory. Look at Mablethorpe, 2007. There was a man I went to architecture college with called Mike Odes, whose father ran New Trends Holiday Park at Chapel St. Leonard's. And we went to Canterbury together. And um, we had long graduated. And he said, do you want to come up to Lincolnshire next weekend? I said, what's, what's going on, Mike? He said, um, something happening at Mablethorpe. He said, there's been an international design competition for architect -y types to design the beach hut of the future. And I came up with him. I have never seen so many designers speaking different languages in one place as when this came out. Jabba the Hut, made of layered plywood of different colors in a tear shape, a rentable beach hut, which completely redefined the image of Mablethorpe in the eyes of many. And this has been maintained and built on, and I totally applaud it. What happens now? Beach huts to buy or rent. The entire seafront has been improved, and how else can we build on big sky country? The world's first cloud bar opens. Um, and um, on Anderby Creek, and remember, cloud spotting is a top 10 bestseller of a book. If this is big sky country, take it. Make it what it is. Um, extraordinary place of, of beguiling huge, empty um, landscapes over marshes or with spires or ruins of abbeys and so on. It's the highest concentration of abbeys in Britain is down the Witham and um, Bardney and so on. Uh, it's, it's that, that's this wonderful, beguiling landscape. Uh, and uh, I love the last sentence of this. It said, it was a shame that the event was rather marred by the weather. There's barely a cloud in the sky. <laughs> Rebel country then. If Lincolnshire has these quirks and distinctivenesses, it runs through its people as well. Guess the title of this Victorian image. It's Hereward the Wake. Was he Saxon? The, the, the theory currently is that, in fact, he's the son of a Dane. But this is the Dane law. This is, a, this is an invaded, occupied part of Britain. Our distinctive hard A's. I have a bath. I walk down the path. It's from, from the Dane law, not medieval French south. It's distinctive. We still speak a bit of Dane. We still have some of the attitude. The title of this picture is How Hereward Cleared Born of Frenchmen <laughs> by Henry uh, Courtney Seelis. And we, and we know what that means. Hereward then, as the defender of the Dane law, doesn't like William the Conqueror, and anyone who comes over from Normandy is fought by him. This is rebel country, ladies and gents. What comes next in sequence? I, I don't even need to illustrate it. Who's the greatest rebel in Lincolnshire? The Lincoln Imp. 
postcards. It, it breaks my heart. There's no Lincoln Imp postcard. He's the greatest pull in the cathedral, is actually the little rebel, isn't he? He's the devil, which makes the cathedral work so hard and all the angels have a job to do because of this little character who we light up and we put 20p in the box and there he is. Rebel country. The Lincolnshire Rising were the people who first dared speak up against Henry VIII when the, when the dissolution of the monasteries came in 1536. It was they who then marched up and joined the, the band from York under Robert Ask. Um, but it's the Lincoln rebels, 1536. The Pilgrim Fathers, where'd they come from? Scrooby, via Gainsborough. They set off in 1607 from near where Immingham is now. Uh, and um, eventually the Mayflower went in 1620, but it began here. Religious dissidents, people who thought in a different way. What about the old rebel country? Go to the United States. There's Lincoln, Nebraska for you. There's Boston, Massachusetts, um, created by a Bostonian man in 1630. There's Stamford, Connecticut. Um, the furthest one in the south, Spalding County in Georgia. All of these places, has there been um, a movement to call Lincolnshire the old country in the US and Canada? Come back and see where it began. Um, put it in airports. Come and see the old country. This is your route. We're rebels. You, you, America thinks they're um, um, anti-authoritarian. This is where you came from. As is epitomized in the Lincolnshire poacher rhyme, when I was bound apprenticed in famous Lincolnshire, full well I served my master for nigh on seven years, um, till I took up to poaching, as usual quickly here, oh, tis my delight on a shiny night in the season of the year. Do you recognize the last part of that? In the season of the year, Radio Lincolnshire... It's taken from this rhyme. It's 18th century poacher about the rebel. Uh, we can uh, wrestle and fight, my boys, and jump from anywhere. It's rebel country, ladies and gents. That's why this is brilliant. The kinema is the only rear-projecting cinema. People love it because a guy still comes up on a Wurlitzer and plays to you. Nothing like it anywhere else. Make the best of the quirks. Rebel is idiosyncratic. That's what Lincolnshire is. Links to links. I ask people on Twitter, what are your links to links? What do you make of Lincolnshire? Do, do you belong? What's your connection? The biggest answer, yes, Melvin, sausages. The biggest connection in people's mind are Lincolnshire's sausages. It's the county with the bounty. That's what I reckon Lincolnshire is. It's the biggest outdoor food basket. The, it's the bread basket of Britain, um, right next to um, Grimsby. You know, fish. Extraordinary produce, last year's Lincolnshire Sausage Festival. It's brilliant, it's quirky. It was made fun of as a concept 20 years ago by Vic and Bob in a film called The Weekenders for Channel 4, where they saw at St. Pronter Print in Arndale there's to be a meat festival. Meet smart, Vic. Let's go to, let's go to uh, St. Pronter Print. And there they go, and there are two people with a stall for the meat festival, where there's a giant misunderstanding and they sample some of the meat on display. Brilliant. There's no such thing as bad news with something that's quirky. Even Paul Daniels' sausage quip sparking a homophobic storm when he said on, on um, his cha-cha-cha with Strictly Come Dancing, Craig Revel Horwood should not give up his day job tasting sausages. I don't know what he meant by that, but he explained that it's because Craig was the ambassador for National Sausage Week. It was all quickly sorted out, and Noddy Holder became the ambassador for 2011. The British Sausage Week Awards. Where is this? Lincolnshire? No. Banger Rally. Look at it. It's in The Guardian. Life and Style. Sausages. Got its own section. British, British Banger Week. 400 specimens. What's the benefit of this other than a bit of a laugh? It is that two million pounds worth of sausages get sold through this. 186 tons of sausages are sold. It happened in the cathedral, I think, recently. Lincolnshire is the home of the British sausage. If, if other people don't think it is, well, then they can come and visit the Lincolnshire's Superior Sausage Festival to make their case. Take ownership, ladies and gentlemen, of the quirky. What, as my advice, be proud of, but don't overstretch the exceptional. The historic superlatives, make the most of them. Um, but it's not a pattern that can be sustained in our economy. It's the old country. Lincolnshire survives beautifully because parts of it are forgotten. And a benign neglect leaves us with a wonderful inheritance. It's rebel country. Lincolnshire is full of quirky things, quirky places, buildings, people. It runs through our blood. Reveal the unexplored because it's a big county. And if you want people to dwell, yes, come to Lincoln, but then make public transport better. Guide people to other parts of the county. Lincoln can't do seaside. Lincoln can't do walls. It can't do fens. And so link it all up. 
Make your links to links link. Make it humorous, make it fun and quirky, give people seasonal variety, tell the stories that make Lincolnshire's local qualities national issues. Um, and that, ladies and gents, is where I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you.